from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer <coughs> Harpster. I'm a digital reference specialist with science, technology, and business here at the Library of Congress. I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Volcanoes, Near, Far, and Really Far Away. This is the sixth and final program, unfortunately, in our 2010 series presented through a partnership between our division and the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. This has been our fourth year presenting programs with Goddard, and there'll be many, many more. So is there anything on this planet that could be more frightening and powerful, and yet at the same time more mysterious and beautiful as an erupting volcano. We are fascinated by the fire, the lava, the magma that burst out from inside the earth. The smoke plumes, which are clouds and dust, can shoot 10 miles up into the air. So it begs us to ask us what type of energy lives deep within our earth. Volcanoes are not only active on our planet, but they're also active on Jupiter's tiny moon Io. The volcanoes on Io are considered to be the most powerful volcanoes in our solar system. In fact, there are more active volcanoes per square kilometer on Io than anywhere else in the solar system. The study of Io's volcanism gives us a window into the birth and the evolution of our world and provides information about the causes of weather, geological change, and the chemistry of life. Our speaker today, Dr. Ashley Davies will share with us his expertise on volcanology, focusing on terrestrial volcanoes, which are near to us, and extraterrestrial ones that are really far away. Dr. Davies received his bachelor's degree in astronomy and geology from England's Hatfield Polytech, Technic, sorry, and his doctorate in vol volcanology from England's Lancaster University. He joined NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory at the California Institute of Technology in 1994 as a postdoctorate associate, and two years later, he became a full-time research scientist, which he remains today. He is the principal investigator of volcanoes on Earth, as well as on Io. He has received numerous awards based on his work at NASA, and most notably a 2005 Software of the Year Award for spa Spacecraft Autonomy. It is with great pleasure to have Dr. Davies visit us today and speak with us about his research of volcanoes that are near, far, and really far away. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Davies. Thank you very much. Well, today I'll be describing how a lava lake on a distant moon of Jupiter just might be the most important target for a future mission to the outer solar system. In order to answer one of the biggest of fundamental questions, is there life out there off Earth? Now, probably the most likely location where life or conditions that could support life in the outer solar system are to be found uh, are on Europa, which is a, a very small, icy covered moon of Jupiter. But the lava lakes that I'm going to be talking about today aren't on Europa, but are on a neighboring moon, the insanely volcanic moon Io. So to unlock Europa's secrets, we're actually going to look at Io. Io's volcanoes tell us what's happening inside of Io, the interior conditions, the, the transfer of heat. And what happens inside Io, I will show, also affects what happens inside Europa. So in order to understand Io's volcanoes, I've been studying the Earth's volcanoes and lava lakes in particular. I th think that I have one of the coolest jobs in the world because I study volcanoes for NASA. It's astonishingly exciting. Um, I spend most of my days in an office staring at a computer screen, but just once in a while they let me out to go and play on a real volcano. Um, but seriously, I mean, it's very important to visit Earth's volcanoes to, to, to gather data and to test models of volcanic processes. These are, are mathematical models of, uh, of, of the eruption of lava. 
and it helps us understand what these, how these volcanoes appear to remote sensing instruments on spacecraft. Um, it's easy to tell you know, how hot a lava flow is on Earth. You can just go up to it and literally stick a thermometer into it and measure its temperature, which you can't do this on other planets. It's something, this is, a, this is a job that's literally taken me to the ends of the Earth. Uh, what I've been doing is studying lava lakes because of their importance to understand Io's volcanism. Uh, so this is me a, a few years ago in Antarctica. In the background, we have Mount Erebus, the world's most southerly active volcano. Uh, at the summit, there's a large crater, and at the bottom of that crater is an active lava lake. And then last year, I found myself in Ethiopia, and there's another lava lake at the volcano called Erta Ale, one of the most astonishing places I've ever seen. Uh, more about these, these lava lakes later in the talk. Before we start talking about the interior of Europa and this big question that came up at the beginning, is there life out there? I think it's important to step back from, from that question and consider why worlds are volcanic at all and the importance of volcanoes. Well, volcanoes are first and foremost agents for change. This is Mount St. Helens in, in uh, erupting in 1980. Just a couple of days ago, a volcano in Indonesia, Mount Merapi, erupted with great violence and great loss of life. Um, but volcanoes are, uh, have shaped the surfaces of, planetary uh, of, of planets and satellites across the solar system. Um, here we have, uh, uh, on Earth, uh, more than 250 million people live within uh, roughly 20 kilometers of a volcano that can do this, explo uh, erupt explosively, um, often with, with great loss of life. Uh, stepping back from the, the human element, volcanoes are windows into the interior of a planet. They are a manifestation of interior heating, and they're of great value to planetary scientists because they take what's inside the planet and erupt it onto the surface, lava and gases, and other material, which can then be studied by instruments on, uh, on spacecraft. So volcanoes are, are great at, at determining what the interior conditions and the interior composition of a planet are. Uh, there are many styles of volcanic activity, but what I've been studying are, are lava lakes. Uh, now, a lava lake is the top of a column of magma connected to a deep-seated magma chamber. And it's an open system, so lava circulates around but from the surface down to, uh, down to the magma chamber. So these are very useful for determining interior uh, conditions. These are very rare on Earth, but we think that they are very common on Io. Uh, and as such, um, the study of lava lakes is, uh, is very important to understand um, Io's volcanism. Uh, I think that these are going to be prime targets for the next mission to Io in order to understand some of, uh, actually answer some of the outstanding questions about uh, Io's volcanic activity. Io was discovered uh, by the great Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei. And I think it's very fitting that we bring him up now. Uh, the first talk of the year was by uh, Michel Faller, Dr. Michel Faller sitting here, who, who described Galileo's observations and his struggles to, to, uh, to uh, put forward his ideas uh, and, and advance to science his science, uh, but Galileo, uh, it was in 1610, it was 400 years ago this year, that Galileo turned his new uh, telescope, it was a Dutch invention, he turned it to the heavens and uh, observed Jupiter, and uh, saw that Jupiter had, uh, this is his notebook from, from the uh, 9th of January, 1610. He noticed that Jupiter had these little, little points of light, these, these small stars very close to it, and he charted out the positions of these stars and the way they changed position over the next few nights and very quickly came to the conclusion that these were actually moons orbiting Jupiter. And uh, now these are called the Galilean satellites. These are the four largest moons of Jupiter. Let's skip forward a few hundred years. In 1979, uh, the NASA Voyager spacecraft, and there were two of these, flew through the Jupiter system. Um, and at Io, they made one of the greatest discoveries of planetary science, which was that Io had these huge volcanic plumes erupting from the surface. And this forever changed our perception of the evolution of the solar system. Up to this point, it was thought that the moons of the outer planets were just 
small, cold, dead ice balls. But here we had evidence of, of active, dynamic, evolving worlds. The follow-up mission to the Voyager, the Voyager spacecraft, was the Galileo mission, named, of course, after, after Galileo Galilei. And uh, I was privileged to be on the, one of the instrument teams, uh, the Near Infrared Mapping Spectrometer. Here we have NIMS up in the corner. It's an instrument that is very good at measuring the heat given off from volcanic activity. And down here in the corner, we see a visible image. This was taken by the camera on board the Galileo spacecraft of Io. And next to it, and, uh, we have uh, a NIMS observation, which shows the heat from large volcanoes erupting merrily away on the surface. Um, this image on the left shows the Galileo spacecraft uh, being configured. And uh, unfortunately, the, the big antenna, which is closed here, never actually opened uh, fully. And so the amount of data that came back from, uh, from the mission, although the mission was a great success, did leave some, some, some big gaps in IO coverage, which still, which still need, to be, need to be filled. So here we have the four Galilean satellites, IO, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Io is the satellite that is closest to Jupiter, and Callisto is the satellite that is furthest away from Jupiter. And Io, Europa, and Ganymede, as I'll show, have, a, have this really extraordinary relationship. Uh, here we have Io, as seen by uh, the Galileo spacecraft uh, imaging system. It's an absolutely beautiful world. And here we see the colors here are actually representative of the composition of material that's been dumped onto the surface. So the yellow areas are rich in sulfur, and the white areas are rich in sulfur dioxide. The black areas are silicates. This is silicate lava, like basalt-like material that we see erupting in Hawaii. And the red areas are actually short-chain sulfur allotropes. When you take some, some yellow sulfur and you heat it up in a test tube, it goes through the, some extraordinary color changes. And this is evidence that the sulfur has been heated up to, to quite a high temperature. So anywhere where you see a black area or a red area is where there is uh, current or recent volcanic activity. It's been estimated that there are some 300 volcanoes erupting on Io at any given time. It really is a, a volcanic wonderland. It's an absolute paradise for a volcanologist. But the truly amazing thing about Io is that it's actually volcanically active at all. Um, here we have Io and the Moon. Uh, the Moon was once very, uh, this is actually to the same scale, so they are almost identical in size. The Moon was once, billions of years ago, incredibly volcanically active. These dark areas on the surface, the Lunar Mare, are actually vast plains of basalt lava in layers many kilometers thick. But, uh, but the Moon is not active today. Now, the Earth has large active volcanoes, and this is because of the internal heat and the mechanism by which heat is, is generated. So when the planets and their moons formed, a lot of radioisotopes were incorporated into the planets. And the, when these radioisotopes decay, uh, decay uh, it generates heat. Now, the laws of physics dictate that a small body, like a moon, loses heat a lot faster than a large body like the planet Earth. So this is why we have uh, active volcanoes on Earth, but there's no active volcanoes on the Moon. Uh, many, many, in the case of the Moon, billions of years ago, the, uh, the heat that was generated internally was lost to space. Volcanism slowed and then stopped, and this, this geological engine that was powering these dynamic processes came to an end, and volcanism was still forever. And this happened on Mercury, and this happened on Mars. So these are all bodies which were mostly internally heated. And then we come to Io. Io is different because its heat source is external. Io is caught in a gravitational tug of war between Jupiter, Io, Europa, and Ganymede. And this is a, an orbital resonance that was discovered by Laplace. So for every orbit that Ganymede makes, Europa makes two orbits, and Io makes four orbits. So every time Io passes Europa, Io gets a kick in the pants. It gets a gravitational tug, which squeezes its orbit from a circular orbit into a more elliptical orbit. And this causes distortion of the entire satellite. And just like bending a piece of metal, it heats up. 
and this extraordinary amount of heating manifests itself as widespread volcanism. Now, this was actually um, figured, figured out. This whole tidal heating process was figured out by three scientists called Peel, Casson, and Reynolds, who in 1979, just a couple of months before the Voyager spacecraft arrived at Jupiter, published a paper where they said that because of this tidal heating, there should be maybe some, some, some hint of volcanism on, on Io. And uh, this was probably the best timed scientific paper because a few months later, they were proved spectacularly right. Just to put the amount of volcanism on Io into, into some kind of context, this is the amount of, uh, of material erupted by Earth's volcanoes every year. Most of this is actually taking place out of sight at mid-ocean ridges. Oh, by the way, both of these observations, both of these images uh, were taken, uh, obviously at separate times, but by the Galileo spacecraft. The first the image of Earth was taken on an Earth flyby on the way to Jupiter. So we have about 25 cubic kilometers of material erupted from volcanoes on Earth every year. On Io, the amount of material that has erupted is somewhere like 500 cubic kilometers. And we know that this is uh, a minimum value because there are no there were no impact craters seen on Io. Impact craters scar the surfaces of just about every solid body in the solar system. Uh, and these are used to actually date the surface. How many impact craters there are, the older the surface. On Io, there have no, been no impact craters identified at all. So um, we know that uh, we know this is the amount of material that has to be erupted as a minimum in order to disguise and bury all of these impact craters. So it really is a truly astonishingly you know, volcanic place. And the scale of activity on Io, the way in which uh, the, the, the scale of activity on Io, the, the size of the eruptions really do dwarf their contemporary eruptions here on Earth. So we see similar styles of activity, but on Io, they just, they're just on a much larger, larger scale. So here we have an observation obtained by Galileo. And in the center, we have uh, this, this feature here called Prometheus. And here we have uh, a little bit more detail. We have this, this, this bright ring, which is actually uh, plume deposits uh, rich in sulfur dioxide. Uh, actually, this plume results from lava flows flowing across the surface over a surface that is basically sulfur dioxide and sulfur ice. And the ice gets melted and vaporized, and it forms this plume. And in the middle, we have this big flow field here. So let's take a closer look at that. Here we have the Prometheus flow field. And this entire area was emplaced between uh, the Voyager and Galileo missions in about uh, 16 years. But this total area is about 3,600 square kilometers, about the size of, of Rhode Island. Uh, and we can compare this with Earth's most active volcano, Kilauea, in Hawaii. And this is the area covered by the flows in Hawaii in, in about the same time. And again, no matter what process you look at, we see that Io's volcanoes are on a much larger scale than, than volcanoes here on Earth. Uh, here's another feature here called Tupan Patera. It's absolutely beautiful. This is another Galileo image. This appears to be a lava lake, but it's a lava lake about 75 kilometers in diameter. Now, the most powerful volcano on Io, uh, in fact, the most powerful volcano in the solar system, is at Loki Patera. And this is a feature which has every, everything that, every piece of data that we've gotten from, from Loki seems to indicate that it's a large lava lake. But if it's a lava lake, it's a lava lake with an area of over 21,000 square kilometers. So this is you know, larger than the, the state of West Virginia. Um, it's the most powerful volcano on Io. Uh, and, uh, NIMS, the NIMS instrument, again, NIMS is, if you remember, NIMS is a, an instrument that, uh, that can measure the heat from a volcano, obtained an observation, which has been converted here into a map of, of surface age. The way this works is you can measure the temperatures with NIMS and then convert that into an age of exposure. So we actually have a temperature map on the surface. And what this seems to indicate is that resurfacing of the, the, the replacement of the crust on the lava lake uh, periodically starts in the southwest corner of this patera and then proceed at about a rate of about a kilometer a day round this horseshoe shape. The best, the best, most unambiguous um, feature on Io where we think a lava lake exists is this feature called Pele. And this is a nighttime observation. Again, it's false color. Um, and this is a lava lake probably about, about 40 kilometers 
in diameter. And Pele is located at the center of this red ring right here. And this is, again, the, the, the deposit from a, a gigantic volcanic plume some 300 kilometers high, which deposits this red short-chain sulfur um, uh, allotropes on the surface. In comparison, here we have a pretty a fairly typical lava lake on Earth, uh, where these are tens of kilometers or, or larger uh, in size on Io. Here we have uh, a, a typical um, terrestrial lava lake. This is Kupaya Naha in Hawaii. It was relatively short-lived. It lasted about five or six years. And this is typically tens of meters across. So in the wake of uh, the Voyager spacecraft and Galileo and Cassini, we've discovered more and more dynamic worlds across the solar system. Here we have uh, Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn, and Cassini, the, the Cassini spacecraft uh, discovered these, these salty water plumes erupting from massive fissures in the southern hemisphere. This is another moon of Saturn called Titan, uh, and this is Europa, the, the Jovian satellite. Uh, and both of these worlds have geologically young surfaces, so we live in a solar system which is not not, not dead snowballs, but active, dynamic worlds. Uh, all of these worlds are tidally heated, but nowhere in the solar system is tidal heating more pronounced than at Io. So Io is the logical place to actually study how tidal heating works. So here we have Europa. It's a small, icy, ice-covered world. Uh, and part of the problem of determining just how much heating is taking place internally uh, through this orbital resonance with Io and Jupiter is because we, we don't really know what the interior is like. We have a, 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 uh, an outer layer that's rich in water and water ice. We have a rocky silicate mantle, which, which is this area here. And we have a core, which is either iron sulfide or iron, and the size is, is not known. So th there are a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, uncertainties as to what the interior structure of Europa um, is like, and there's also the same uncertainties apply to the interior of Io. But we do know that Europa is a very dynamic world. This is a Galileo image. Uh, the area is about 240 kilometers across. And we can see here where the crust is split apart and in the, into these cracks has welled up from below some liquid or some icy mush, which is then frozen into place. And the lack of, of, of a large number of, of impact craters does tell us that this is a very geologically young surface. Now, it's pretty certain that there's a large water ocean on, on Europa underneath the ice crust, uh, although the community is a little divided as to how thick the ice crust is. But this gives us this tantalizing set of ingredients. We have liquid water. We have tidal heating taking place. Could this lead to conditions that are supportive of life. Uh, NASA certainly thinks so, and would very much like to go back and take a close look at Europa. But to understand tidal heating, I think that the best place to go to actually understand that particular process and to, to give better understanding as to what's happening in Europa is actually go back to Io. So this is just to recap my thesis here. We know that Io and Europa are gravitationally bound together, which causes heating inside the moons. Now, how much heating is taking place, and perhaps more importantly, where within the satellites the heating is taking place is not very well constrained. But we know that tidal heating is most pronounced at Io, and so knowing Io's interior condition constrains just how much energy is transferred into Europa. Now, to understand what's happening inside you, uh, inside Io, the eruption temperature of Io's lavas are a diagnostic of the interior conditions and composition. So we look to Io's volcanoes to get this important temperature data. But before we do that, we have to really understand how to do this particular measurement. And this is not as easy as it, as it sounds, because what we're trying to do is tell the difference between something that's erupted onto the surface, which is very hot, and something that's erupted onto the surface, which is very, very hot. And so here we have uh, the cooling curve for different kinds of lava on Io. And this is basalt. This is what we think, this is what, what comes out of the volcanoes uh, in Hawaii. And it's the most common volcanic rock in the solar system. 
And here we have Kamatiites, which are very high temperature lavas, which were once very common on Earth billions of years ago and probably reflected a time when Earth had a hotter mantle. And that's kind of important because we're trying to figure out what the temperature of Io's mantle is. But if you dump these lavas onto the surface and compare them, you, then we see that it only takes a few seconds for something erupted at Kamatiitic temperatures to cool down to the temperatures of basalt. So only a certain number of volcanic styles will actually reveal what these very high temperature areas, uh, will actually reveal these very high temperature areas and allow us to make this differentiation between very hot and very, very hot. So what I've been doing with colleagues over the last few years is, is look at the way in which volcanoes erupt material and then mathematically modeling the process of cooling in order to, to, to make this fine differentiation between eruption types and, and eruption um, compositions. And so here are our three candidates for when we get back to Io, what we should really look for. Um, here we have uh, lava fountains. This is where a dike reaches the surface, forms a fissure, and then lava erupts out. It's very, very spectacular. And we know this style of eruption takes place on Io because you know, we've actually seen it. Some of these eruptions are so large that they are detectable with large telescopes on Earth. But they're kind of rare, so you, Galileo did see a couple of them, but they're kind of rare, so we have to be careful about, uh, about uh, uh, how we put our, our, our flybys together the, as the spacecraft flies past the, uh, the, uh, the satellite. Um, we have to be able to react fast to, to catch these eruptions when they take place because they don't often last very long. Uh, on a much smaller scale, uh, there are skylights, and a skylight is a hole in the roof of a lava channel that is basically roofed over itself. And these are very useful for determining eruption temperature, but they're very small. So you'll have to get in very close to Io to see them. But on the plus side, these are probably very, very common on Io, at places, for example, like Prometheus. And then we come to lava lakes. Now, these are large, persistent features, so we know where they are. And the fact that they are constantly resurfacing themselves and exposing lava at high temperatures is why I think these should be the prime targets for a future mission to Io. So in order to understand how these lava flows and these, la these lava lakes work, um, I've been looking at uh, lava flows, uh, I've been looking at lava lakes on Earth. So a few years ago, I went to Erebus Volcano in Antarctica. It's on Ross Island. Here we have this, uh, an observation taken from Earth orbit with uh, instruments on uh, a spacecraft called the Earth Observing One. And this is in the visible, visible wavelengths. And this is in the infrared using another sp spectrometer not too different from NIMS, and you can see the heat being given off from the lava lake at the summit. It really is an extraordinary place. And this, is, this, this mountain is about 3,700 meters high. Uh, so here we are on the summit of Erebus on a beautiful, sunny summer day in Antarctica when the temperature was about minus 40 centigrade, not including, uh, not including wind chill. So you have to wrap up. Um, Here's, our, here's the camp. Uh, here's the camp. This is the tent I slept in. Temperature never dropped below about minus 20 in that. And here we have the, the, the summit, the little cone on the summit, uh, and this plume is actually coming off, off the lava lake. Um, this is at the summit with a thermal imager, which is pointing down into this big crater. The crater is about ooh, 600 meters across, about 250 meters deep. And at the bottom of that, we have this lava lake, and it's, a, it's quite of a rare, it's kind of a rare magma type, probably not the best type for studying Io. This is called a phonolite, and it, it actually erupts at a slightly lower temperature than basalt does. But this is really astonishing. It's about 40 meters across, and uh, it really was one of the most extraordinary things I've ever seen in the field. And this is a, a, a time-lapse movie, it's kind of a short duration time-lapse movie, uh, showing the temperature distribution on the surface of the lake. What is happening here is lava is welling up from beneath, spreading across the surface, cooling and then sinking at the edges. And this is the sort of thing that I've been doing uh, to, to calculate what the, the thermal signature, if you like, of this eruption is, and then comparing it with data that we've gotten from uh, the Pele Lava Lake on Io. Uh, and then I've been creating models of, of the process. And this is something I created for, uh, for, for Pele. And it, it's just a, a, a cartoon of a mathematical model which shows that how, how lava rises up from depth, reaches the surface, 
uh, spreads across the surface, cooling all the time. And as it gets to the edges, then it cools and then sinks back down. So this is a, a mathematical, it's a cartoon of a, of a, of a mathematical uh, model of, of a volcanological process. And it allows comparison of the data that we got at Erebus to the data we got of the Paley Lava Lake on Io. And uh, this is actually a fit. It's a little difficult to, to, to understand, but it's a fit of the data that we got at Erebus and the best fit model uh, output. And you get a very, very, I was actually, you know, this, this is very, very gratifying to me because this is a, a very, very good fit of, uh, of the actual data with the model data. So this, is, um, this increases our confidence uh, in, in our analysis of remote sensing data because we know that the model works with, with data that we've collected in the field. Um, this tiny difference between the two curves here is important because that's the effect uh, in magma eruption temperature shown as, uh, as this little, this little d difference in the two curves. And this tells us that um, uh, because the model that I used to fit these data used a, a basalt temperature, and what we have here is a phonolite temperature, which is a little lower, um, the model is actually sensitive to, to the data and the eruption temperature. And this is very useful when we, when we want to go back to IO. So it shows the model works. Now, what we saw here was the, the quiescent overturning of the lava lake. The lava rises up, spreads across the surface, and then sinks. Um, but just occasionally, every six to nine hours, the lava lake would do this. This is a camera. This is a camera mounted on the rim looking down. It's a, it's a, it's a false color image. With enough gas built up in the lava lake, this is what it would do. Thing explodes and throws out lava bombs sometimes up to three quarters of a kilometer away. Um, very, very impressive, uh, and uh, you really do have to be on your toes and be very careful uh, when this happens. Um, because these bombs can, you know, can really do you some serious, serious damage. Uh, I must tell you a story about the guy who, you know, all the bad acting aside. Um, the, the guy underneath, underneath the rock here, his name's Alexander, Alexander Gerst. He was, a, at the time, he was a, a graduate student at the University of Hamburg in Germany. And then a couple of years after this photograph was taken, he was accepted. Uh, there were 22,000 applicants and six successful candidates accepted into the European Space Agency Astronaut Corps. Lucky devil. So his, he has a, a whole new wonderful playground uh, to play, with, play in in the near future. So just to summarize the results from Erebus, uh, what we found from the analysis of the data that we collected in Antarctica is that the lava lake thermal signatures, these characteristics that identify a feature as a lava lake, uh, for lava lakes on Earth and Io are very, very similar, which is really useful because it helps us understand um, uh, uh, the analysis of remote sensing data where we can't get in close to see what's really happening. Uh, the model fits used to interpret our IO data work really well with terrestrial data. Again, that, that's very handy. And um, most importantly, the analysis is sensitive to eruption temperatures. Remember that eruption temperature is the thing that we're trying to nail down on IO. Now, another opportunity manifested itself just last year to go to an even better lava lake on Earth. And this is in, uh, in Ethiopia. So from the coldest place on Earth, we're going to a really hot place. On the left, we have an observation obtained from Earth orbit, and then we see this crater at the, surface, at the summit of, of the Erta Ali volcano. On the right, we see Erta Ali, which is located here at the northern end of the East African Rift. Uh, uh, the East African Rift, this is where Africa is actually pulling itself apart. The reason I got, I got out here, I was actually doing some filming with the BBC. They were making a, a documentary series called uh, Wonders of the Solar System. Of course, Io is... is one of the greatest wonders of the solar system, and, and so uh, out we went. And here we have the lava lake, and this is probably more like uh, the lava lakes uh, on Io because it's, a, it's this low viscosity, quite runny lava. Um, here it's basalt, uh, again, this very similar to the material that erupts in Hawaii. And uh, here I am with another thermal imager, and I've got to say, I've, I've never had so much fun <laughs> all my life. But the reason I look a little pink here is because this is another beautiful, sunny summer day at the summit of Erta Ale. And the temperature, the ambient temperature was 56 centigrade. It was 133 Fahrenheit. 
So it was, uh, it was kind of uncomfortable, but it, it's extraordinary to me that this is a hundred centigrade hotter than the summit of Mount Erebus. So these lava lakes tend to be in the, in the most you know, awkward places in the world. Um, and this is a, a, this is a, a little movie I made uh, with, the, with the FLIR imager, and it shows a, uh, an hour in the life of the lava lake compressed down into 10 seconds. Again, the, the, the colors here are representative of temperature. It's a temperature map. So this is what the lava lake is doing. You can see how lava is welling up on the far side of the lake, and then it spreads. And as it spreads, it cools. And then it's destroyed. The crust is destroyed at, at, the, at the margins. But what's of particular interest here is a little lava fountain that forms just about there. And uh, what we're doing is, uh, is analyzing these data and using this as the basis for designing observations to better understand eruption temperature. I just love this data. I could watch this for, I could watch this for hours. <laughs> But we don't have hours, I'm going to have to stop it. OK, one more time. OK. <laughs> so some of our results from Erta Ale are that uh, we found that, the, uh, as expected uh, and as predicted by our models, that lava cools really fast, uh, so that observations to nail down temperatures have to be obtained very fast. Uh, with Galileo, um, there were often seconds and minutes, or sometimes even hours, between uh, observations. And, we, and this is just not fast enough. Now, this is by no means a criticism. Um, Galileo was designed before we even knew that there were these large silicate volcanoes on Io. And we, we see as far as we do because we stand on the shoulders of giants. But our conclusion was that observations of Io's uh, lavas as they erupt have to be obtained in a fraction of a second in order to nail down those eruption temperatures. So here we have the pieces of the puzzle. We know how to identify lava lakes on Io from their characteristic thermal signature. We have a good understanding of how lava lakes behave, how they sometimes explode, how they deposit material to the surface, and this, this forms a crust which then spreads and cools. So we know what observations to make. I should be showing these ticks. OK, how to identify lava lakes? Understanding of how lava lakes behave, we know what observations to make. And we have models that we've tested against terrestrial data to actually interpret what we see from spacecraft. But now we need the data. We need to go back to the Jovian system and see what, uh, what we can do. So. This is, of course, an incremental process. We, each new mission builds on the, on the success of a previous mission. So Voyager discovered Io's volcanoes with instruments that were actually not actually designed for, for looking at silicate volcanism. This was completely unexpected. And Galileo discovered that uh, widespread silicate volcanism, of the type we see in Hawaii, was what was happening on Io. And now the big question is just how hot are these lavas? Are they hot or are they very hot? So really, a new mission is needed to go back and, and understand what IO secrets are. And actually, prospects are very good. Uh, NASA is proposing uh, a, new, a new flagship mission called the Jupiter Europa Orbiter, or JEO. And this is a mission to go back and study in great detail Europa. But it will be making close flybys of IO. Um, the flybys will be very fast, so this does, have, this does create some problems with collecting data at, at the closest point to Io. And the instruments uh, that, uh, that JEO will have will be optimized for studying Europa, not necessarily uh, studying Io. But uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to really start unlocking uh, some of Io's secrets. Um, what would be really nice would be a, a mission that's just dedicated to go to Io. And uh, one has been, has been proposed by, uh, by Professor Alfred McEwen at the University of Arizona. And it, it's called the Io Volcano Observer, uh, not surprisingly. And this is, like I said, this is just a proposal. Nothing has been selected. This is just an idea to go back there. Um, but this would be a mission uh, dedicated to studying Io's volcanoes and the interior processes with instruments designed specifically for Io's unique environment and these volcanic processes that are taking place so that we can finally nail down the eruption temperatures of Io's lavas, constrain the interior state, and give us a much better idea as to how much energy is being transferred through this gravitational resonance from Jupiter into Io and from Io into Europa. So this is all part and parcel of, of incrementally stepping forward to understand unlocking the secrets of the Jovian system. 
So in conclusion, we are in a new golden age of space exploration. We have spacecraft across the solar system that have visited Mercury and Venus and the Moon and Mars. We have, uh, we've had recent missions to, to Jupiter. We have the Cassini mission in orbit around Saturn, sending back incredible data of, of the ring planet and its, and its moons. And we have the New Horizons spacecraft on its way out to Pluto. It'll arrive in a few years. So it's a great time to be, to be working for NASA in, this, uh, in the planetary exploration business. And now we can start to answer some of these big questions. We've now learned enough that we're starting to understand where to look and what to look for to answer the big questions that have vexed philosophers for thousands of years. Where did we come from? Are we alone? in the universe, and at least in the solar system, Europa is a prime target for this, which is why NASA is looking, is looking so closely at it. But I feel that to fully understand Europa, we need to go and look at Io's lava lakes. And just to finish, I'd just like to thank uh, Michelle Thaler and the staff of the Library of Congress for arranging this, uh, the this, this great opportunity, and the NASA Planetary Geology and Geophysics and Outer Research out of planets research programs for providing continued support over the years for research. Uh, thank you all very much indeed. Do you for some questions? Uh, absolutely. Any, uh, any questions? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, yes, uh, the, the question was, uh, how many scientists around the world do I cooperate with? Uh, it, it, studying Io is a pretty small field, but there are lots of volcanologists around the world who, uh, who I work with uh, in the United States. I have colleagues in, in England. I have colleagues in Italy. The Italians are great, are great volcanologists. They have Etna and Vesuvius and all these, all these great erupting, erupting volcanoes. Um, most of my colleagues are in the United States and, of course, uh, at the University of Hawaii, Hawaii Volcanoes Observatory. United States Geological Survey, uh, study volcanoes uh, across the United States and also at other locations around the world. So um, just like NASA, we have, you know, I have a lot of international partners. Uh, and uh, uh, Tom? An encouragement to ask questions. We, we have NASA's right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a brand new science calendar. And I'm looking for a question from the homeschooling group. It has to be a good one. <laughs> okay, you Critical next. thinking is Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, Oh, right, um, Io is a gross polluter in, uh, in the Jovian system. Uh, it erupts a lot of gas onto the surface, uh, or in, into the atmosphere, or a very, very thin atmosphere above the surface. And uh, these large volcanic plumes carry material up, um, in, and this is then lost into space. So surrounding Jupiter is this, is this donut-shaped um, band uh, with Io in the center of it of, of, uh, of, uh, of material, sulfur ions and oxygen ions and sodium and potassium and all kinds of interesting stuff which had been thrown off the surface of Io or knocked off by charged particles. So uh, this in, in part also, you know, some of this stuff actually does end up on Europa. So one of the things that the next mission will will investigate is, is uh, what's, what's been thrown from, from Io onto Europa, and you have to figure out what, what's, been, what's been polluting Europa from Io in order to better understand the geological processes on Io. You need to make sure that you're not, you're not getting things mixed up. I think that's a good question. Uh, yes, sir. Can you go farther and then comment upon this gravitational resonance? If Io is polluting, mm. the gravitational side is probably the flip side of this, is it not the tugging and pulling, or what, what, what does this mean? How is this energy transferred? Right, it's a, it's a, very, it's a very complex process uh, because the, the way in which energy moves from one body to the other depends on how well that body distorts and how when you apply a stress to it, it, uh, it, it relaxes after that stress has been applied. And this depends on uh, interior composition. It depends on the degree of melting that's taken place. And it depends on the the, uh, the the physical characteristics of the of the material. 
So well, I'm not proposing that just understanding IO's temperatures will immediately constrain what we see on Europa, but it will go a long way to, to really nailing down what the interior composition of IO is. And that is dependent on where IO is in this, this evolving dance, because there's evidence, uh, actually there was a, pub a paper published earlier this year, that IO uh, and Europa and, and Ganymede, the orbital resonance is actually cyclic. Uh, this, this is the, the result of, uh, of looking at um, uh, some hundreds of years of, uh, of uh, ground-based observations of where the satellites of Jupiter were. Uh, and the idea is that uh, it appears that the level of, 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 uh, of uh, tidal input into Io is actually balancing the energy that's being released at the surface. Uh, and it looks like Io is now at a peak of, of heating on a cycle that might have temperature spikes every 140 million years. So you have to look at this, this coupled evolution of the orbits with the, you need to couple that to the evolution of the thermal structure inside the planet and the evolution of, the, of, 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 each, uh, of each satellite in order to really understand it. But I think that knocking Io's eruption temperatures on the head and really nailing that down really does help us understand what's happening within Io. It's a good place to start. Yes, ma'am. Excluding money, what are the other challenges you face in uh, other missions? Um, a lot of brilliant minds coming up with even better ideas. Uh, the, you know, a call, uh, the way this, this process works is that uh, you know, NASA puts out a call for, for great ideas, for missions to go across the solar system, and uh, these proposals are put together, and, uh, and then NASA takes these proposals and uh, whittles out the weak ones and looks at the strong ones and eventually makes the very hard decision as to which one or two out of the 20 or 30 um, uh, proposals uh, will be supported. And uh, a lot of these are excellent ideas with a lot of uh, strength behind them and a lot of great science that's being done. And it's a, it's a peer review process uh, to get to that point. And uh, really, it, you, your, your proposal has to, be, has to be better than the other guys in order to get funded. Uh, yes. Um, I guess two questions. One, the ratio of lava lakes to w regular vol or more conventional volcanic volcanic features is that the same on Io and the Earth? Do you have more lava lakes on Io because you have more volcanoes, or is there something with the tidal heating that creates more lava lakes? Um, right. That's a good question. Um, it's it's difficult to classify mm. a. a most of the of the of volcanoes on Io as being lava lakes or being lava flows, because we have a uh, uh, we have uh, uh, uneven coverage both temporally and spatially, uh, and uh, especially especially the wavelength range. So it's difficult it's difficult to actually nail down what proportion there is of of lava lakes to to. Uh, uh, to lava flows, although we are working on that. Um, actually, a couple of papers that are, that are in press now uh, have, have split up the amount of energy that we see from lava flows from what we see from the Patere, which are these, these volcanic depressions on the surface of Io. Um, but what we do know is that we, there are specific, specific volcanoes, specific sites on Io where we have enough data, where we have a, we're very, very confident that, that we know what the style of volcanic activity is. Uh, yes. All of your work, um, all of all of the findings that you are and, and papers that you're writing, is all of that based on those two missions, or are you constantly looking um, at them and coming up with new? Right. Uh, data? It's very difficult to get short wavelength data, which are which are good for determining eruption temperature. But uh, there's been a, there's been a huge. Uh, uh, advance in the last 10 years with, uh, with la using large ground-based telescopes uh, such as the, the, the Keck telescopes in Hawaii and a technique called adaptive optics which is uh, for, many, for many years uh, ground-based telescopes were limited by their ability to, to correct for atmospheric distortion and atmospheric movement but using adaptive optics we can actually correct data and Technology has advanced to the point where we can now study Io's volcanoes with large ground-based telescopes. Uh, and so proposals are put forward, and we do get data, and we do publish data on, on telescope observations of, uh, of, Io's, of Io's volcanoes. Um, so that is, that is still going on. So we're still building up a good temporal history. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, 
Right. Uh, sulfur is is a very common is a very common uh, vol volcanic volcanic product. Um, it goes back to the the distribution of elements within a planet when it first formed, and uh, the fact that sulfur is is often caught up in crustal material when it forms when it when it uh, when it separates out. And uh, on Io, um, it's. Io has over billions of years sort of baked out all its sulfur and all its uh, its water and all its sulfur dioxide, um, and the water has escaped to elsewhere in the in the Jovian system, but the sulfur and sulfur dioxide has remained because it's it's heavier atoms. So on Earth, where we have this outer layer which is rich in water, uh, on Io we have this outer layer which is rich in sulfur and uh, and sulfur dioxide. And this is constantly being reworked and, uh, and mobilized uh, by, by this, this very hot silicate lava that comes out from the interior. In terms of implications for finding life, right. I, yeah, I, 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 I think Io is probably the worst place in the solar system to look to actually find, <laughs> actually find life. Because um, of all the volcanic activity that's taking place, the lack of water because it's, it's so crazily volcanic that it's boiled off all of the water that it ever, it ever had. It, chances are that when it first formed, it would have had uh, an, ice, an, ice, uh, an ice covering, but, but over geological time, that's been, that's been blown away. <laughs> the screensaver kicked in. Um, so uh, it's also a very hostile environment because it's, it's deep in, in, uh, in Jupiter's uh, magnetic field and it's constantly being bombarded by charged particles. So any organism there um, would be subjected to very, very high doses of radiation, which is actually a problem for spacecraft uh, as well. Okay. Uh, thank you very much indeed for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.